Boogie Down with reformed Dabo girl Chase Masterson as she takes you inside Discovery every week on the all-new Star Trek podcast, Disco Nights. From the producers of Inglorious Trexperts, wherever you listen to the 430 movie. And keep looking at the stars. Hey, this is Mark A. Altman, and if you're a fan of Disco Nights, you'll love Inglorious Trexperts, the hit Star Trek podcast for Star Trek fans with a life. Join Darren Doctorman and me every week as we take you inside 50 years of Star Trek and boldly go where no podcast has gone before. Available every Sunday at 17100 hours wherever you listen to podcasts. Back in the 70s and 80s, before the advent of VHS, chances are if you saw a classic movie, it was on the 430 movie. With their famous theme weeks, it was a chance to see movies you never saw before and get reacquainted with some old classics. So, join us now for the 430 movie. Hey, this is Mark A. Altman, and get ready to get reacquainted with some old classics. Uh, It's (laughs) time travel week. Time travel. I'm here with my fellow time travelers uh, who have spent some time in the future where we're going to spend the rest of our lives. Uh, It is none other than Darren Doctorman. Hello, Mark. I'll see you in the future. <laughs> Ashley E. Miller. Uh, I have to tell you that this podcast turned out so great. <laughs> <laughs> and this may not mean much to you if you're only listening at home or in the car, but we also have Steve Marty McFly Melching here. <laughs> I'm sorry I'm wearing a uh, fashion that's a few years out of date. It is 2018 now, but uh, you back, know, in my, you back in 2015, you were pretty cool. I when laser discs were still huge. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Well, guys, uh, this is this is going to be a fun one. Um, it's time travel week here on the Four Three Movie, and this, of course, is where we curate fantasy theme weeks of movies uh, in which uh, pay homage to the classic Four Thirty Movie of our youth, uh, based on themes. And uh, we'll be looking at movies in which there's time travel involved. It's pretty self-explanatory. Well, you know, technically, every movie is a time travel movie. They, most of them, move forward in time, one second at a time. 24 frames a second. Oh, 24 I was frames gonna a second. going to say, this is our first podcast that's fully interactive because we are all moving into the future. That's right. Simultaneously. And I have to say, we just entered uh, 2019. It's the beginning of 2019. And here we are uh, recording our first uh, you know, f- first podcast. Uh, and I thought we had a great year last year uh, with some fabulous episodes. We're and- speaking to you from the past. <laughs> <laughs> the year 2018. We're assuming we survived until 2019. Yeah, well, I did. I, I did. <laughs> uh, I have some news for two of you. But. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> oh man, you got to watch out and, and look both ways before you see that truck. Um, okay, well, uh, time travel. If you could go to any era, if you could time travel, where would you go? Oh boy, Darren. Uh, past, <laughs> present, or future. Yeah, you know, I would probably say uh, I would want to visit the past, just because it it would be very interesting to me. Mm. Um, Any specific era? I I'd like to I'd like to visit the 1940s. Mm. Preferably not the uh, 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 German Front. The, that that wouldn't be my first uh, <laughs> yeah. first choice. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I I don't know because I really enjoy living in today, honestly. But there is something fascinating about wanting to see what it was really like in other times. In other times, absolutely, absolutely. And I, it's funny, you mentioned the 40s. I, uh, years ago, I asked my grandmother, you know, if she missed living in the 40s. And she's like, oh, God, no. It's yeah. so much nicer now. <laughs> right. We have air conditioning. And- <laughs> but I think one of the things about movies that we love is because it can take you to any time. It's like a time place. machine. It is. It's like Don Draper describing the slide projector. That's right. The Kodachrome. Well, it's would, like a time machine. I, I would love to see a dinosaur. I want to know what dinosaurs really looked and sounded like. I think you'll know really for a couple know. minutes, and then, then you'll, yeah. be you'll, sorry you'll know what the out. inside of a dinosaur looks like. Oh, my gosh. Like. It's Chaka. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, you know, I, yeah, I'd be afraid to step on a butterfly, and suddenly we're all Nazis or... Yeah. More <laughs> Nazis than we are. <laughs> well, maybe you could remake uh, Peter Himes' The Sound of Thunder and make it good. So, uh, what about you, Ashley? You know, here's the thing. I, am I going to go? <laughs> I'm going to go with my blink response. When you first asked me that question, what was the first thought that popped into my head? And here it is. And I'm not sorry. I want to travel to the 25th century 
because just like Buck because Rogers, exactly like Buck Rogers, Aaron just Gray because, was super yes, hot in that white Aaron Gray, <laughs> Will McDeering. I, that show came out. I had like pneumonia and like tuberculosis and bronchitis. Oh, not maybe not tuberculosis, but I had like pneumonia and bronchitis and all that. I was dying, man. I like had a fever of like a hundred and three. And that show, Will McDeering, saw me through it. And um, I've never forgotten it. And you know, you uh, I want to go to the future and You could just her. go back to the 80s and meet her. Oh, shit. Good she's, point. She's there. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> You're yeah, right. You can go to Bloomingdale. The she's there at Bloomingdale. <laughs> the 80s weren't bad. It wasn't like, because look, at some point you're going so far back in time that people have awful teeth and no medicine. <laughs> yeah. Right? And screw that. But in the 80s, teeth are good and there's medicine. And music is cool, depending <laughs> on who you talk to. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. Wow. Those are all interesting. What about you, Mark? Choices. Well, let's turn that that, yeah. that fixed eye on you. <laughs> yeah, man. Wow. Mr. You had you had to ask. Um, <laughs> well, no, not really. But he did anyway. I, I think um, you may ask. Uh, I um, I think the future. I mean, I'm 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 totally a history buff, and I'm really interested in the past. But I I just I want to know is that what Star happened? Trek future ahead of us or. Is it uh, something more dire, you know? Uh, I don't know. I, I, I think the future, um, probably the future, tw- 23rd century, you know? <laughs> but my, my, uh, my desire to visit the past is mostly because I want to see how, much, how many things we have wrong about how the past was. Right. Mm. Sort of idiocracy in reverse. You know, look, yeah. and on the other hand, that's the movie version, the TV version, which is more character based. You know, <laughs> I'd want to go back to the past to see relatives who passed away. Absolutely. You know, so that would be that would re- that more than any, that would trump everything. You know, yeah. I would much rather see my father again. Yep. You know, than 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 you know, uh, go to the future and see people I have no idea who they right. are. Well, than and, see and people you, prob- you probably wouldn't like. Yeah. Right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I know we're not. talking about I don't movies. Like many people. Uh, yeah, and obviously, it's a movie podcast. But there's an interesting is book it? called uh, Doomsday Book, written by Connie Willis. I don't know if anyone's familiar with that, but it's. Um, about a group of university researchers in Oxford, I believe, and they have a time machine and they send the researchers back in time and for a period of a couple weeks at a time to study what the sort of medieval times were actually like. Mm-hmm. And, the, and the story of the book is um, this student gets trapped, stranded back there. Well, that, that's the back. Michael Crichton book, Timeline. He ripped it off from Connie Willis. Uh-huh. Good to know. Well, yeah. look, I can tell well, you something. Well, he went back in time and, yeah, and yes, wrote it first. Exactly. When we were kids at 4.30, we weren't reading books. We were watching movies. Right. Yes, we were. On TV. On TV. On TV. <laughs> <laughs> With commercials. Yes, we were. And uh, so it's only fitting to uh, uh, usher in uh, Time Travel Week by looking at you, Steve Melching, Monday. Well, for me, you know, there's no better way for, for my money to kick off Time Travel Week with just one of the ultimate crowd-pleasing time travel movies of all time, uh, Back to the Future. Shocker. The guy Shocker. is literally dressed like <laughs> Marty McFly. <laughs> <laughs> This movie, you know, I don't know how anyone can't enjoy this movie. It's one of those rare Hollywood entertainments that is just kind of perfect. It just fires on every cylinder. It's got a really tight script, maybe almost too tight. It's like everything is a setup or a payoff it's like or a, a callback. Clockwork. Or it, it really is like clockwork. Uh, it's got a wonderful cast. I'm really glad that uh, Eric Stoltz didn't work out and they uh, hired uh, Michael J. Fox because he's just perfect in the role of Marty. And, you know, Christopher Lloyd is Doc Brown and, you know, Leah Thompson, uh, Crispin Glover. Uh, it's it's just a really wonderful film that is so elegantly put together the way they explain the rules and the internal logic of time travel so that you understand everything how it works and how Just it, looking at that picture is the characters disappear and you, you yeah, it's physical there's a manifestation visual of, of, yeah, yeah it's no. not only in dialogue but it's visual it's like 88 miles per hour you see that 88 on the you know you know what that means and and you know what yeah the 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 picture disappearing and uh we know libyans are bad right Right, yeah, the the clock tower flyer that he's handed that tells him when lightning is going to strike, and you see the the clock tower, and that becomes this you know geographical and visual uh, the thing that's well, going to it's it's a textbook uh, representation of setup and payoff. Yes, um, everything 
that works in the movie is because it's carefully laid out. Right. And everything, everything uh, you know, links together and works as a story and as a cause and effect or effect and cause. Uh, and it, it all works so well because um, Bob Zemeckis and Bob Gale uh, really took great pains to map it out and make sure that it worked. Yeah, and, and, and you know, whether, and it, it's big things, it's also small things, like mm-hmm. lines of dialogue right. that are repeated by characters or, or variations uh, or... Uh, um, uh, uh, it's like poetry, it rhymes. <laughs> 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 or, you know, just subtle things like the Twin Pines Mall right, right. and then Marty runs over one of the pines so in the past pine. and he comes it's back and it's a complete throwaway pine. joke. Yeah. But it's completely... You might not even notice it. Works I the, never did. Yeah. <laughs> I never noticed. <laughs> Thank you for bringing that to my attention. I always learn something new on this show. That's why I come back. Um, and it's got a great score by yep. Alan Silvestri. It's got great use of uh, pop music in it. Um, Huey Lewis. Yeah, yeah, and Huey Lewis. I loved it. Yeah, I loved Huey Lewis at the time. And I, I remember going to see that movie opening weekend uh, with one of my best friends who – Oddly enough, got hit by a car in a parking lot. At 88 <laughs> miles per hour. <laughs> not, hurt, not injured seriously, oh, but oh, bumped man. and bruised a little bit. Right. So we had to skip and see a later show. And we ran into our creative writing teacher in the lobby who had seen the show that we were going to see. And, he, and we told him he'd been hit by a car. And he's like, oh, that's funny. That happens in this movie. <laughs> wow. um, you terrible. know, I, I probably saw that movie five or six times that summer. Mm. And, uh, you know, I just... I just adore it, yeah. uh, and and of course it spawned uh, two sequels. That I'm really fond of the second sequel. Me too. I'm really fond of Back to the Future. Too. I am not remotely fond of either sequel. Well, hmm. I, I can go with you sort of on Back to the Future three, which I thought was sort of overpraised. But I, I thought that um, I agree with Steve. I I thought that Back to the Future two was wildly wildly undervalued, and it was just. I appreciated that it went in its own direction. I kind of I loved kind of the dark tone of it. Um, I I just I thought it was just a very funny um, even send up of itself. Uh, and it just the I find the future is just fun. It's like the, the well the versions of the future that are just fun. You know, 2015 when he first arrives and just it's it's kind of awesome. I appreciate the Brandon Bragg of it all. I think I mean I admire it in terms of. Yeah, you know, how the way it interacted with the first movie, and you know, it's it's almost too cool for school. It, you know, it's very clever, but I don't particularly like it. I don't find it very satisfying. The third one, you know, I like westerns, so I mean, it's fine. It's not a great movie. The but, third one isn't a western. But, it's a, it has western trappings. Yeah, so, but yeah, but just... but I mean, the first movie is just as close as you can get to a perfect popcorn movie. Absolutely. You know, it's not in my like top ten greatest movies of all time, but it's a pretty perfect movie in you know in terms of everything that Steve discussed. But I, I love the sort of the, the going back like and um and really kind of doing a like Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. Mm-hmm. I I was I had a smile on my face in Back to the Future too when when I realized what they were doing and they're like they're in the future and then they went back to this dystopian past because it had been changed right. and like this nightmare 1985 and then Doc Brown once again using those great simple. Maybe too simple, but literally drawing maps on chalkboards right, so you understand right. what's happening. And when I realized they have to go, go back, back to, to the first movie, yeah, and I thought I just loved that. I thought that was one of the most amazing things I'd ever seen. And you know, there's some goofy stuff in it. You know, some of the characters are maybe a little broader than they, especially Biff Tannen is like well, a he, homicidal he, um, maniac. Yeah, he <laughs> did foreshadow <laughs> Trump. So, yeah. well, uh, in in 1985, uh, Back to the Future came out. About three months before I left Illinois to come to California to go to USC. And at USC, we had a class that I signed up for, which was called um, Art and Industry of the Motion Picture. And every semester, they would have a different new released film that the instructor would bring in members of the crew from this film. And that semester was Back to the Future. And every week we had a different representative from that worked on the film. And we had Alan Silvestri, we had Bob Gale, we had uh, uh, Kevin Pike who, who did the uh, floor effects and, and um, a whole bunch of other people uh, who worked on the film. And it was fascinating to get this first look at, uh, you know, what actually went into uh, doing the film. And it's funny, uh, when Alan Silvestri was in, they screened the uh, uh, the sequence where Marty goes 
goes back near the end the, during the uh, lightning storm. And they had turned off the sound. And as it happens, uh, a friend of mine, Van Ling, and I were in the class and we were sitting there and we were humming the music along <laughs> with the movie. And um, because we'd seen it, right. you know, like yeah, six yeah. or seven times already. Yeah. And the lights came up and, and Alan Silvestri goes, you guys, you guys were singing the music. You, you, how, how did you know where the music went? He said, well, you, you, we just seen it. And from that moment on, Van and I became fast friends, and uh, he's the reason that I'm in the movie industry these days. So it's, no, uh, it's hilarious. But It's just so clever and so funny. I mean, you look great, at the, great movie. Where they, you, know, you talk about setups and payoffs, the whole thing, where he sees the, the uncle you know, in the crib, and he says, get used to those bars, <laughs> kids. Joey. Yeah. Uh, and, and you know, circling back quickly to Back to the Future 2, I think that was the first movie set I ever visited. Uh, a friend of mine, film school, Brian Singer, was working on the Universal lot when that film was being shot under the code name Paradox. Mm -hmm. And I went and visited him. Me and a couple friends went and visited him in the editing his editing room. And uh, we just, one night, just walked around the Universal back lot. Mm -hmm. And uh, we knew that Paradox is Back to the Future 2, but we didn't know anything about it. So we walked on into Courthouse Square when it was all art-directed, like Future Hill Valley. And, and we our minds were just blown, like seeing the Future Hill Valley, mm -hmm. you know, with the courthouse with that glass front on it and the lake of water in front of like what is happening here and also probably th th not probably it is the greatest back lot in all of Hollywood yeah. is Universal yeah. I mean th I envy that experience I've had that experience on other lots I've never had it on Universal and to just be able to walk around at night you know, when a lot of the stages are closed down and to, to you feel the ghosts of Hollywood past. Yeah, we had a good five or it's... ten minutes on that set before a security guard found us oh, and chased huh. us off. But oh, really? I, yeah. I also got to one of my first jobs out of film school as a, a, a runner and I had to I had to run some material. Run runner. <laughs> run my, over to the Universal back lot and uh, ended up driving down that same street that Marty drives down to get up to 88. And, you know, I'm in the car humming the music yeah, like Darren the, driving towards the tram. The... <laughs> get out your Kodak, Kodak cameras. It's take a Kodak picture. Kodak. You you might be seeing something really interesting happening in just a moment. Don't be surprised <laughs> if something Cat... pops out and scares you. <laughs> Was Cattle Queen of Montana playing at the theater? <laughs> No, I mean, look, Back to the Future is, is great, and and I think it was just my expectations at the end of the movie. You know, is where we're going. We don't need roads, and it, it felt it had the mm. promise of something really exciting and upbeat. And I think the cynicism and darkness of of the second movie it didn't appeal to me. Right. Again, I, I respect what they did because I think it's a very smart movie. I just don't personally mm -hmm. dig it that much. That's um, understandable. I kind of feel that way about the third one. I like it, but I don't love yeah. it as much as the other two. And it's funny because, I, it, sorry, you know, I was just going to say, I'm, I'm really surprised. You know, I know Spielberg and Zemeckis have been really against rebooting it or something. But given the device of the DeLorean, it does feel like that is something that would lend itself to sequels or to a franchise. Or Plus, you know. you'd go back to 1985 and it would be. You know what? Yeah. I, I've, I've been thinking about that for quite some time. And I think there must be some way to use the footage that they shot with Eric Stoltz mm. as an alternate Marty McFly, uh, you know, wow. and have Eric Stoltz in the new movie. Oh, that's funny. Well, and, and something something happens that sort of splits off the, you know, the timeline again, hmm. that Marty is a completely <laughs> different person. Uh, that and this timeline, that can, officer, officer, can we set up a pitch meeting? Uh, <laughs> Bob Zemeckis on line one, please. Eric Stoltz did do a movie with Lee Thompson. That's Some correct. kind of wonderful, which I love. Oh, yes. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, yes. That's good. The, uh, here's uh, my thing with three is it didn't really have anything to say. It yeah. just, it felt like a sequel. It felt yeah. like a thing that sort of, here's the premise and we're going to go back and the stuff that yeah. you saw before you like is going to happen. Um, whereas with two, I mean, and I totally get, I remember uh, many people felt that way, that like the 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 change in tone was, was off-putting to people. But I think at least Back to the Future 2 had something to say about the premise um, that you can feel, um, you know, the mind's behind it being fully engaged with the premise and kind of seeing like where that premise can go which I which I always appreciate um, and I would think there is actually a lot more stuff to mine I'd love to see it, and obviously you know nobody's there have been very few times that if somebody said hey Ashley what do you think about a remake of 
blah, 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 and I haven't gone, okay, sure, write the check. But <laughs> blah, 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 part two. two. <laughs> part two, Electric Boogaloo. Uh, but Back to the Future, I think, is one of those movies that you could actually like remake and just completely um, kind of recontextualize with the as as a contemporary film mm-hmm. and change almost nothing else. And it would work as long as you were consistent with the time period, as long as you were consistent with your presentation of the 80s and how somebody remembers the 80s and kind of what that means to now. It's Because really what Back to the Future is about, it's a generational film. Yeah. Right? It's, um, it's about what would it be like to know your parents when they were your age. That's right. And like and what was their what was where does their point of view come from? Mm-hmm. It's it's really a movie about developing that that empathy and that sort of generational understanding, which I think is fascinating and I think it really work great. Today. See, I'd like to know what Einstein was doing the whole time they were back in the 50s because they sort of just left him there. You mean the dog? Yeah, the dog. Yeah. Okay. Einstein. Yeah, yeah, yeah. not like <laughs> you know what Einstein was doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Einstein. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, he, he, look, and I mean I think also maybe the reason people don't like the third one is, you know, it's really more Doc Brown's story than Marty, you know, right. and um, maybe that's not as appealing as sort of the Marty of it all. And plus, the the way Doc Brown acts in the third doesn't really make any sense compared no. to how he was behaving before. Right. Um, it would be like having a Batman movie where Robin is the hero. Well, I'm sure that's coming. <laughs> it's called Teen Titans. Oh. <laughs> yeah. But no, you're, I, I, I get the analogy, and I, I think it's I think it's true. I mean, um, but uh, but okay. Uh, enough about Back to the Future. Um, <laughs> An obvious pick, <laughs> enough, but uh, this movie. a fun no, way to kick obviously off. Obviously, well deserved, and I think we would be har- horribly remiss if we had not yeah. included it in our list because it, in a way, it is the definitive time travel movie um, and the most beloved. I would yeah. say as well. Uh, Darren Dockerman, Tuesday. Tuesday. Uh, Back to the Future 2. No. (laughs) (laughs) Touche. I'm going to have to go back in time to 1960 for a film that actually did appear on the 430 movie, George Powell's The Time Machine. Oh, Oh, great choice. I'm glad you picked that. Um, Not the remake? Not the remake. Please, (laughs) to for goodness sakes, not the remake. Mm. Um, uh, It's... It's... A wonderful sort of uh, look at the book, but it's not the book. It's uh, Rod Taylor plays the scientist, uh, George, and he, I mean, he's basically playing uh, the the author, right, Uh, H.G. Wells. And he has invented a time machine, and he has his friends over for uh, New Year's Eve in at the turn of the century in 1899. And he shows them this uh, little model of this device that he's built, and then he says goodbye, and he goes forward in time uh, to the year 802,000, I believe. And you know he we he sees the he sees the future and how uh, mankind has split into two factions, one uh, living above ground, the Eloi, which are very uh, mild mannered, uh, dainty beings who uh, apparently live carefree and happy and uh, um, and uh, you know very sweet and uh, and childlike people, but. The flip side of that is that below ground lives the animal-like Morlocks who live in darkness and operate all the machines that keep the Eloi's life uh, wonderful. Of course, we learn that the Eloi are being bred as cattle for the Morlocks, and uh, it's very scary. I mean, it's it's uh, uh, part of the magic of it is that the time machine itself is beautifully designed. And uh, uh, people like uh, Wah Chang and, uh, uh, oh, my mind just went blank for the, uh, the effects uh, people who uh, uh, did it. But um, it, it's, it's, it's marvelous. And the, the, the process of seeing the time machine go back in time, it, it's a little goofy, but it's fun. It, it, it involves, you know, stop motion of uh, the shop across the, across the street uh, changing uh, with each year. And uh, it's, it's a fun movie. It has an amazing score. 
uh, that uh, is extremely memorable. And it feels a little dated, but not a lot. And I think most of that is due to, uh, you know, that sort of style of movie making. It's very formal, and it's not uh, it's not uh, extremely flashy. It's very straightforward, but it's a lot of fun. I assume you've been to Bob Burns and sat in the time machine. I have never sat in it because I I, I want to you know I, I want to make sure that it is untouched because mm. uh, I I you know it's beautiful. It's, it's beautiful. It's, it's, thing. it's such a great, you know, look, this is to us, we've talked about this before, the kind of movies we would see on the 430 movie that gave us the exposure to movies we might not have seen otherwise exactly. that I feel a whole generation of film lovers now are missing out on. It's so great that you you called attention to something like The Time Machine because it, it, it is such one of those seminal sci-fi movies like along with Forbidden Planet, mm -hmm. War of the Worlds. And without the 430 movie, we would have never been able to see it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, it's it's... You know, it's one of H.G. Wells' great stories, mm -hmm. um, and it's really a great adaptation. And Yvette Mamou, who later went on to fame in The Black Hole, <laughs> uh, is, 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 went on to lose her fame in The Black Hole. Delightful, uh, went delightful right in down it. That black hole and um, never came back. It really, uh, really, and just a beautiful design, um, as you mentioned, uh, production design, art direction, and it's got that. It's you know. Uh, uh, Alan Young, who plays his uh, best friend, Mr. Philby, um, gives a, a sweet performance, a, a very bad Scottish accent, but it's uh, it's very sweet, and the you know the 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 whole cast is is fun to watch. Yeah, no, it's and and of course one of the great time travel books makes one of the great time travel movies. And they've tried to remake it a, a few times, mm -hmm. and I think they're yeah. trying to do it again. They are. Yeah. And it's just, stop. Just stop. <laughs> it's tough. I know a lot of people like the remake. A lot of people who like the remake. Ooh. I haven't seen it. <laughs> it's like, I saw that remake, and like I wanted to throw things at the screen, man. I thought it was, I mean, it was like, it was the one that, um, like, H.G. Wells. Si like, Simon, Simon Wells. Simon Wells. His, his grand, his, yeah. Grand yeah, well, he, he cocked it up. Such a British expression. But, uh, but incidentally, Simon Wells did some design work on Back to the Future. Did he really? Two, actually. Mm. Yeah. Well, God bless him. So it's his there fault. you go. It's yeah. well, you know. <laughs> no, I, I think, kidding, I'm I think there are a lot of factors that made the remake uh, uh, unpleasant. Yeah. 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 Okay. So on Tuesday, the Time Machine. Wednesday, Ashley. All right. And you've warned us to expect something unexpected, which Man. is only appropriate and apropos for Time Travel Week. So here's the deal. Originally, when we did this podcast, I presented a, a movie that was just incredibly out of the box. And it was a movie that I love. And the podcast was great. But then you're some gonna, things happened. And I had to travel back movie. and... Um, and fix now your there's mistake. my to, to change my mind and, and fix my mistake. Oh, my God. Uh, so here's the movie um, that I'm going to pick. It's Wait, is right. that a second Ashley Miller in the back of the studio? What is he doing it, back it there? It might be. There I am <laughs> watching <he> us. <laughs> plotting like the third go around. Ashley, if you say Star Trek for the Voyage Home, you're out of here. I'm not going to say Star Trek okay, for the Voyage thank Home. Thank God. Or you're out of here. <laughs> uh, okay, here's the deal. Right. Go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 uh. <laughs> All right. So, look, man, I am 10 years old, uh, and for the first time, I discover HBO. And my grandmother has it. I don't know why she has it. We it was don't, a very delicate does. time. It was a very mm -hmm. delicate time. Um, that was when HBO, as we've discussed, stood for Hey, Beastmasters on. But there was <laughs> uh, there was another movie that played huh. constantly. Looker. It played, yes, Loved Looker. Uh, it played constantly, over and over again. It played time after time. Oh, oh. yes. Nice. Good choice. One of my favorite movies. I watched that movie like Costner watches the Zapruder film in JFK. <laughs> it just, oh, look, it's H.G. Wells. He's going back and to the left. Um, so the premise of this movie is. By the way, great uh, companion piece with his choice of Time yeah. Machine. 
And, and honestly, that's what made mm-hmm. me decide, you know what? Screw it. I'm not going to do the thing I was going to do. Let's talk about this. Um, because I'm the gratified. hero of this movie is is H.G. Yeah. Wells. H.G. Yeah. Uh, Wells himself, who it turns out in this film, directed by Nicholas Meyer from Star Trek fame. Um, he uh, obviously directed Star Trek II and Star Trek VI, and he was one of the screenwriters on a movie that I will not name because I will be kicked out. Right. Okay. But so if you like that movie... You'll enjoy parts of Time Start, After yes, Time as well. well. <laughs> Very much so. So H.G. Wells, it turns out, actually invents a time machine. He has his friends over for dinner. He wants to show off his invention. Um, he shows, he, you know, one of the people he shows it off to is uh, is David Warner, who also, like, they both later become Star Trek villains. Um, one is good. Uh, <laughs> or Star Trek, Star Trek characters. Warner never really played a villain on Star Trek. Um, anyway, so... David Warner, as it turns out, is playing Jack the Ripper. And when the police, when the Bobbies show up the Bobbies. <laughs> to arrest Jack the Ripper, he scampers down to the basement, he fires up the time machine, and he disappears. But the time machine comes back because there isn't the key that H.G. Wells holds. Right. Wells realizes that uh, he can't unleash this monster on the perfect utopian future that he imagines. So he gets in the time machine and he follows him. He follows him to the year 1979. And the movie is this pursuit. H.G. Wells um, applying like all of these things that he's learned from uh, that he loves from you know reading um, uh, Sherlock Holmes adventures mm-hmm. uh, to track down Jack the Ripper. He meets Mary Steenburgen, who is awesome. We later go on the fame and Back to the Future Three. <laughs> right. um, and it's just this great little cat and mouse. And there's this amazing scene where he finally catches up to David Warner. Mm-hmm. He, ca- he catches up to Jack the Ripper, you know, and he says this line that just it just sits with me it, it, it's, and he says you know in you know in 1893 you know I was a freak I was a monster but here I'm an amateur and it's just <laughs> such a great line so chilling and the scene where he thinks that um, that his love has been just torn apart right. by Jack it's just you just look at that my god as a child like watching that scene they're just body parts just pieces of body everywhere and it's awful and uh, and Malcolm McDowell is so great in this film. It yep. has a perfect ending. Um, it's just I love it. And as as Darren said, um, there is certainly the the DNA of this movie is is very much in um, Star Trek the fourth movie about. Oh, he Voyaging ripped off. The, he, he he admits it. <laughs> yes. he took a bunch of the same tricks because he had so little time when Harv approached him. They were so far down the road. That uh, Har Bennett, um, you know, he, he's like, I need you. I, I don't have time to write this. I'm going to write the bookends in the 23rd century, and I need you to write, you know, the, the time. San Francisco. Francisco. I've done that already. Yeah. <laughs> and, and and it was really easy for him. He wanted to change it to France because he'd done San Francisco already, <laughs> but it, it didn't work. And he said, we where are you going to find the whales? <laughs> you know, <laughs> Nick Meyer says, where are you going to find the whales in the Seine? You know, it's like, so they left it in San Francisco, but then Nick Meyer I recycled. It's sort of like... Uh, Spielberg taking that joke from 1941, right. which he did, eh, and then doing it great with the coat hanger and, and Raiders. Right. Um, and 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 Nick Meyer does the same thing. He lifts a bunch of stuff from time after time and uses it because not a lot of people saw that movie in Star Trek Four. Right. And uh, dun, 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 so dun, so great. Dun, dun, yeah. dun, 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 it's really dun, just dun, a successful dun, dun, movie, and it's it's a great um, sort of mystery thriller. It's a it's a great. Um, piece of science fiction, um, and I just love uh, the audacity of uh, Wells is the hero. There's well, something about that. And Malcolm McDowell is the hero. We so rarely see Malcolm McDowell playing a likable. Right. He'd come off of character. Caligula for yeah, Caligula, Clockwork Orange. He would go on, you know, to play villains in many other movies. And um, so it was so great that David Warner, who was maybe the great villain of, of the 80s. You know, mm-hmm. it was 79 when the movie came, but he became, like, associated with all these great villains. But to have Malcolm McDowell then as the hero as H.G. Wells, it's such a great movie. Yeah. And it didn't do a lot of business at the time, but it's really become, I think, among aficionados, a really beloved movie. And I know, mm-hmm. you, you, you know, Nick Meyer, who's been asked about Star Trek Four and Star Trek Two, is sort of ad nauseum. When you ask him about time after time, he just lights up. Mm-hmm. And, in fact, um, a couple years ago, Sid just wanted to show time after time uh, the film festival, the great genre film festival in Spain. I said to them, you really should get Nick Meyer because he loves that movie. I know he'd love to talk about it. And I hooked them up and uh, they brought Nick Meyer to Sid just to talk about time after time. And he was so excited to go. And um, 
the um, you know and they were so excited to have him. It's just a great, great movie. And Warner Archives, it's available on Blu-ray through Warner Archives uh, with a Nick Meyer commentary. And um, that's awesome. I highly recommended, that. definitely. So I would, I mean, look, if there was any movie that I could sit and talk to Nick Meyer about, it probably would be Time After Time. Just because, and look, it also Why kind of call him up. I'm sure he'd be more right? than happy. Yeah. <laughs> it, it plugs into some of his other obsessions. Obviously, like he's a man who loves Sherlock Holmes. Yes. My God, it's like there it is in Star yep. Trek Six. Um, and so you can you can feel him sort of like pulling all of these influences into this movie, and just and it's just great. It's just it's not a pastiche, but it's like it's a stew. Here's a here's a free pitch. Somebody should hire Nick Meyer to do a Sherlock Holmes TV series. God damn right, you mm-hmm. should. Like that would be. Great. Calling my agent. I would go. I would. I would. I would watch that, and I think it would be great because you know, rather than you know asking Nick Meyer to do all the stuff he doesn't really like doing, have him do something he loves, and I think he would do a great, great amazing Sherlock Holmes TV series. Um, so. How many more Sherlock Holmes TV series do we need? All of them. <laughs> well, you have all those stuffy British ones. Like I'd like to see him do. I mean, and of course the Sherlock, which is brilliant. But I feel like there's. Um, uh, I think I think he could do something really interesting. Mm-hmm. You know, I agree. Um, Would love to see it. And then I guess you have Elementary, which is contemporary. Mm-hmm. You know, so speaking of Elementary, Robert Hewitt Wolf is coming to Inglorious Trexperts soon mm-hmm. on uh, uh, um, our sister, our sibling podcast. Uh, it's a great Star Trek podcast hosted by Darren Doctorman and myself. If, if you, you haven't, heard that al- if you haven't already future. heard it, and it's, I don't even yeah. know when it airs and when this airs or whatever, but I know we did it. So eventually, <laughs> oh, it's, it. it's going to air or whatever we it's call it. Or did we? World. Somewhere in time. It's going to stream. <laughs> it's not going to air. I can promise you it'll never air, but it'll stream. Um, okay, so that was Wednesday, time after time. A fantastic pick that was on my list. You made my job that much easier. <laughs> so thank you. Um, my pick for Thursday... Time Cop. Yeah! Well, I do love Mia Sarah. <laughs> you that guy from Time Cop. <laughs> you know, Time Cop's a really cool premise. And apparently, I was in a meeting... Uh, God, we, we, we were talking about, like, you know, for a development meeting with, with, with a studio, and they said, God, everyone's trying to do Time Cop, but I, I guess the, the um, Time Cop's tied up in all kinds of issues with... Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, IP rights. rights issues and stuff. Wow! But people apparently, actually claim. But apparently, to own time this is cop. something. <laughs> yeah, this is something that they, they they've been trying to develop for a while. That people keep pitching Time Cop, and there's wow. all kinds of takes on time. Apparently, it's a it's a hot property, hot property. Now, if they had Time RoboCop, I'd pay. I'd buy that for a dollar. <laughs> <laughs> so, what is your pick then, Mister Alt? What my pick, um. I don't know if the director admits this, but it, clearly a short story that they wrote in the 70s was a huge influence on this movie. Of course, the short story I'm talking about is the Kugel Mess episode written by uh, Woody Allen, which appeared in uh, Side Effects. It's about uh, Down Oz Luck character, Kugel Mass, who meets a magician and uh, finds a way to go back in time and enter uh, and, and carry on an affair with Madame Bovary. And uh, this this sort of short story... Um, uh, in, in, in at least in my mind, inspired uh, one of his many masterpieces, which is Midnight in Paris, mm. in which uh, Owen Wilson's character um, is uh, uh, in Paris with his uh, fiance, uh, who he does not quite see eye to eye with. He's a successful uh, Hollywood screenwriter who has aspirations for um, doing great art um, rather than just collecting a big paycheck. And over the course of his uh, time in Paris, he's transported back in time where he breaks bread with the likes of Ernest Hemingway, played brilliantly by Corey Stahl and uh, the Fitzgeralds, F. Scott and Zelda, and uh, meets all these legendary characters like Picasso. And it's, uh, it is, uh, you know, for, for these people who say, oh, my God, he does one movie a year. Woody Allen hasn't made a great movie I, I, in years. It's like. Really? Well, I could give you a list of probably 25 movies that are, you know, complete masterpieces. And Midnight in Paris is only the most recent. Um, And uh, it's a phenomenal movie. Um, There's a great scene where um, uh, the uh, fiancé's father sends a detective to spy on Owen Wilson to see if he's having an affair and he ends up in Marie Antoinette's court <laughs> uh, and uh, off with his head. It's, it's, it's just, it's so funny and charming, but it also deals with something very real, which is this sort of 
the idea, and it's very applicable to us, nostalgia. Mm -hmm. You know, that we always look back at the future with uh, you know, certain fondness, that there's, you always carry a certain degree of ennui and look back at uh, the, the past as though. And, and, and in Owen Wilson's, he thinks, oh, my God, this, this era in which all these greats lived, this, this, this was really when I wanted to live. And, of course, the people who lived then is uh, Marie uh, Couture's yeah. character who, like, wanted to be Pining around for, for, yet, another for era. yet another era mm -hmm. um, at the uh, you know, turn of the century. And it's just utterly fascinating and, and uh, beautifully shot, stunningly oh, yeah. shot. Um, uh, brilliantly written and directed by Woody Allen, and uh, you know a wonderful cast, uh, and it's it's uh, it's a lovely, lovely, lovely film. Funny and charming and sentimental, and it's a really and wistful, yeah, it, wistful, very wistful. And uh, you know, I just you know, it's funny. I I considered Sleeper, but Sleeper is sort of you know this Chaplin esque farce. You know where Miles Monroe wakes up in the in the future, and you know this dystopian future, and there's a lot of very. You're uh, mentioning other movies. No, again. no, no. I'm just saying. I'm saying <laughs> but but I really, you know, Sleep, Sleeper to me yeah, is is a ha ha movie, but there's not much more to it. Midnight in Paris has works on so many levels, and um, I I just uh, I I think it's a great time travel movie. It has something to say about the different eras right. that it visits, which which I think is it's very meaningful in that respect. You and asked I, before what time period I would like to visit, and I think I know now. I want to visit sometime in the future when you actually run out of Woody Allen movies to use. In well, you know, it's going to be a, a, a long time because, of course, you know, he's had such a... Um, uh, 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 you know, such, such such an amazing career. You know, doing films like Clockwork, and uh, there are just so many, so many classics in his oeuvre. So it'll be a while before I run out of uh, Woody Allen <laughs> yeah. movies. I have to admit, I was I was actually when you started, I was super confused. I had no idea where you were going because the first thing in my head is like, I thought Kegels were a whole different thing. <laughs> <And> then, <laughs> uh -huh. but then I kind of locked into, oh, it's Woody Allen. So you know, it, it's interesting. This is the second film uh, of this uh, chosen for this week where the people move through time in a car. Right. Yeah, that's <laughs> true. That's true. No, but it, it's fun. This film, I rewatched this film actually last year uh, before my wife and I went to Paris um, and we visited some of the locations, you know, in, in Paris, the bookstore and, and some of the streets and the of course walking along the Seine. And uh, it's it's such a beautiful Paris is so beautifully photographed in this movie, and there are tours that you can take in Paris. Uh, you know, Midnight in Paris tours, because there's a sufficient fan base, you know, for this film that want to experience the Paris of that movie. Well, he do you does, have a tour? Do you have a tour at midnight? Uh, no, I'm sorry. We do. <laughs> he, he he does for that city what he did for Manhattan in Manhattan. It's like a love he letter. Just, to it's the a city. love letter. Um, to, and and also Barcelona and uh, oh. Vicky Cristina mm -hmm. Barcelona, but I I, I feel like um, but, uh, but not with L A and Annie Hall, you know. And I had that <laughs> kind of experience. No, I I kind of uh, um, had that experience when I went to the first time I was ever in France. It's sort of embarrassing. Uh, Rob Burnett and I had just done Free Enterprise, and um, we were invited to a, a science fiction convention, a Star Trek convention in Paris, and it was the most remarkable couple of days. You know, spending. Our, you know, time and getting to meet the people in in France and to see. And I, I'll never forget because, um, uh, you know, he said, "Oh, he said, oh, you must come to the um, the, the 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 closing ceremony. Uh, we're going to have a wonderful dinner. It'll be very special." And of course, we've been enjoying the French food. Where where where, where is this wonderful restaurant where we need to come? Planet Hollywood. <laughs> and we're like, what? <laughs> Planet Hollywood. <laughs> We're in freaking Paris. I, <laughs> and, oh, and I, 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 rem I remember. I mean, I, we were, you know, we were out partying pretty late, and I mean, it was like two or three in the morning. I finally was calling it a night, and Rob, of course, was like. I think I'll just keep walking the street. I said, "Well, you know, we have to be at Planet Hollywood at 10 a.m. or whatever." And and mm -hmm. you know, sure enough, uh, uh, you know, I show up uh, bedraggled, but you know, Rob comes walking. I said. Have you slept? No. I've just he's just been walking the streets of Paris <laughs> all all uh, all night, and uh, it, it really it is is truly a a magical a magical city. I think Midnight in Paris really captured that. I also really love the short story um, that it's it's based on. You know all those um, great short stories that are um, 
in uh, anthologized and side effects and you know the the the, the three without Woody feathers, Allen books without yeah. feathers and yeah so it, it's a really fun my my favorite of of his short stories is the horror of Mensa but I really like yeah. uh, Kugelmas um, yeah. uh, episode it's it's really it's really great so. Um, but Midnight Paris is. We actually is, we actually did the horror of Mensa as a uh, 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 humorous interpretation in high school. Oh, oh that's funny. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I had an idea where I wanted to adapt Woody's short stories as um, anthology film, like mm-hmm. adapt the short the short New Yorker stories. And I was trying to option them. And I, it still might one day happen. I don't know. But uh, anyway, that's neither here nor there. What is important is that we now have Friday to program, Friday, Friday, and there's so many movies uh, that we haven't talked about, so many great, I'm sure our audience is throwing up their hands uh, uh, you know, at, at, at uh, or throwing up their lunch. I don't know uh, over some of the you know these choices uh, that we've made, with the exception probably of um, well, Back to the Future. Clearly, they they want us to be excellent to, to each, each other. other. Uh, <laughs> and yes, party on, dudes! I love that movie. Do you? Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure yeah. is okay, a yeah. really fun. Very clever time travel movie. Surprisingly clever. Yes, it's goofy. It's broad. Um, but, it's, but it has Abraham Lincoln in it. Right. <laughs> it's, it's the most... Come on, Napoleon everyone goes to I'm Waterloo. Sure yeah. <laughs> Water loops. Water loops, yes. yes. It's I'm like, sh- come on. I'm sure everyone that's listening wow. to this has seen Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, but if you haven't... But have they have seen Bogus see Journey? Eh, you don't need to see Bogus Journey. It has the corn okay. in it, though. One Except a, for Bill Sadler. Want a Twinkie down. Genghis Khan? <laughs> <laughs> I love Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. Me too. It's yeah. one of my very favorites. It's it, just it's so you just enjoy every frame of it. It's just it's just fun. It's just pure it joy. So much, yes, and and that sequence at the police station at the end when they're trying mm-hmm. to break them out, where they play with the conventions of time travel, is so brilliant. Where they're like, "How are we going to get in there? You don't have the keys." Like, okay, when this is over, I'm going to go steal the keys and hide them here. Like, oh, here they are. Like, <laughs> you, you, well, you better remember to go do that afterwards. Like, but do I have to? They're they're already. You here. know what movie I love <laughs> that takes place in a police station and involves time travel? The Terminator. Terminator. Oh, that's right. That is a time travel movie. Yes, isn't it? yes, it actually and, is. It's one of the greatest I, time travel movies ever. Yeah, I mean, look, I think you know we talked about the perfect plotting in Back to the Future. It, it, you know, the the Terminator is another brilliantly one hundred percent. That uh, mean, like mean. The, the way that Cameron constructed that film, the rules of the time travel were honestly perfect. Uh, because it really absolved him of having to do anything with um, kind of the the paradox of it all, other than than what you were presented, and it was just kind of best represented by the uh, the interrogation of Kyle Reese. Right? Dun, 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 dun. When they're asking him, you know, the uh, the the time machine, like, how does it work? And he just says, I don't know. I didn't build the fucking thing. Yeah. <laughs> and it's perfect. It's yeah. perfect. Perfect paranoid. And delusion. what was it? Four million dollars that Cameron made that for yeah. Lean and Mean, as you said. I remember in college, I saw it for the first time. I think I cut class to go see it. I saw it in a shithole theater in Boston, and the, uh, apparently I heard things scurrying around on the floor, <laughs> and I was so into the movie that I did not leave. I put my feet up on the chair in front of me and watched the you rest of the movie. thought it might be an evil robot hand? It was not an evil <laughs> robot hand. It oh, was okay. the little beady red eyes, but uh, and I don't like rats. But, um, a, but A brilliant movie? Did we program it in Apocalypse Week, though? No, I don't want to bargain with this. We didn't. I mean, my we thing talked about, about it is we, we did that. Okay. I feel like the Terminator is so great. It's such a classic that it honestly deserves a little better than than Friday. What? Mm. Friday's a special no, Friday, day. Friday is a great I know. day. I, I don't think Friday. You're, you're, you're dead. I think Friday is like the culmination of everything we've discussed. Friday is where we come to an agreement. We're not in one person endorsing Streets it. Streets of Fire. All four of us are. <laughs> are, are, are <laughs> says the Which man I who love. cloak I and dagger, cloak fire, and dagger, right? cloak and dagger. Yeah. I mean, d- 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 it's not like a a, a bad day. Hey, Friday is know? the day where you don't have to get up early the nah. next day. You can you're enjoy the four thirty movie. You're relaxing. You're kicking back. I want you to know, because this is Time Travel Week, I went back in time to when we recorded Video Game Week, Yeah, and I replaced my choice with Super Mario Brothers. <laughs> oh, my God. Are we in a dystopian? Wait until you listen to that podcast now. Let me Let me throw out a, a something I, that may or may not be time travel. 
Groundhog Day. I was just oh, going to say. Uh, yeah. You know, I was thinking about is that time travel or not. I, guess I it think it is. is. Totally. Yeah. It's yeah, a loop, absolutely. but it's time travel. Yeah, it is time I travel. don't know if Friday's a good enough day for Groundhog Day. <laughs> I don't know. It uh, might not be. Because here's the thing. Because we, these, these, mo- some of these, look, maybe I'm wrong. I, I, I'm often wrong. They call me often wrong Miller is what <laughs> they call me. <laughs> but it's, I, I, I guess it's just because I love the Terminator so much that I feel like I could talk about it for an entire podcast. That's all. Well, That's why all. don't you go do that? Maybe I will. <laughs> I mean, you know what? It's, it's time travel week, not killer robots week, you know. And right. and uh, and he's a cyborg, right? So, mm-hmm. um, look, cybernetic organism. I, I, yeah. I uh, yeah. You know, look, I'd love to talk about sitting on the edge of forever, but it, you know what? We can't. Not so. a movie. Not, not a movie. movie. <laughs> so, you know, I look. Terminator is great. I think it would be a great day for Friday. But there are also Star some Trek other movies. I, you know what? I, 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 not no, that I it's as good as the Terminator. But it's a great premise that's not executed particularly well. The final countdown. Yes. You know, oh, the final it's countdown. the final countdown. <laughs> oh, right. Which is not falls apart. And it's like, and look, it's so this goes nowhere. Yeah. Just as we're about <laughs> to have the movie okay. that we signed now, up most for. Most people yeah. don't know what the hell we're talking about. So somebody explain the premise of the final countdown. The USS Nimitz uh, encounters a storm on the open seas. That storm uh, transports them back in time to <laughs> just before the attack on Pearl Harbor. Um, they pick up like the uh, the Japanese attack coming in, um, and they scramble F-14s to go and shoot them down. But just as they do, the storm appears again, and they have to go back to the. But at least future. there's one scene where the Japanese zeros fight. You know, American uh, at then at the time, modern Honestly. contemporary American military fighters. You know, fight Japanese zeros, which is awesome. So of course you're building up the third act. We think, oh my god, it's good. they're going to fight the entire. You know, the, the the whole you know Hirohito's you know invasion of, of Hawaii is going to be foiled by the Chester Nimitz. But in this case. The, the USS Chester Nimitz, you <laughs> right. know, and it's going to be the greatest thing ever. And Kirk Douglas is the captain. It's like, oh, my God. And then the storm comes. And, and then the movie's the, over. The movie's over. And it's like, but, what the? And f- the fix, <laughs> by the way, I think, and this, is, this one is free. I've been thinking about this for decades. The, the fix to this movie was very clear and obvious. All you have to do is figure out that, you know, you, you do the math on, um, it's yesterday's Enterprise, right? Yes. It's, yeah. it's like, it, yeah, it's terrible, but if it doesn't happen, then the following things don't happen, which right. are even yes. worse. Right. So you scramble your F-14s, you get the doesn't call get to into come the back, war you send out yep, more yep, F-14s yep. to well, stop the F-14s yeah. that you've sent. You they have, like, they destroy fight. the zeros, yeah. and then they discover when they get back to the, sh- to the uh, boat, yeah. oh, it's what a Japanese boat. <laughs> right, 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 right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, that's the Rod Serling ending, yeah. which is awesome. No, no. Yeah. See, look, you you guys have fixed the movie already. <laughs> like, in 12 <laughs> seconds. Yeah. I mean. All they needed, they need, we need to go back in time and have a meeting. Okay, here's here's the third act then. <laughs> the the guys in the in the fighter jets, they they go back to the, to the aircraft carrier. They discover it's Japanese, and they realize, oh, my God. We have to bomb Pearl Harbor. Yeah. Right. <laughs> we have to do it. What are you, Gene Roddenberry? <laughs> yeah. We got to kill JFK on the grassy knoll. I mean, <laughs> on, a, on occasion, I'm Gene Roddenberry, Mark. <laughs> on occasion. <laughs> but not today. Uh, but yeah. Look, Final Countdown is, is not great, but it has one of the best, like, Premise, concept, yeah. best premise it's so ever. Good. And they filmed on an aircraft yeah. carrier. Yeah. And it looks amazing. It yeah. looks amazing. I just remember that poster. It was it's in comic books everywhere. Poster. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No that in Orca. Everybody remembers yes. the poster. Yes. And the great John Scott Scott score. Dun, 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 okay. <laughs> uh, so we talked about Star Trek Four. You know, there's X-Men Days of Future Past, mm-hmm, one of the right. best X-Men films next to X-Men First Class. Let me Thank throw you. out another one. Somewhere in time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, somewhere in time, Christopher Reeve and the luminous Jane yeah. Seymour. Yes. yes. Mm-hmm. There's that word again, luminous. And well, <laughs> it, it, when the two when the, the, the fits. Um, the fits. 12 Monkeys, Terry Gilliam's. Oh, yeah, yeah, 12 uh, Monkeys. Right. Um, there's Looper, the Looper. Uh, Ryan Looper, Johnson Looper. film. Looper, Looper. <laughs> Idiocracy. Y- yes. Yeah, yes. okay, yes. Yes. Peggy yes. Sue got married, right? So I usually think of time travel movies where the travel is going back in time, but there are some of those films where yeah. the, they travel forward like in time, Sleeper. like Idiocracy or Sleeper or Pla- um, Planet of the Apes. Or when Buck Rogers <laughs> yeah. in the 25th Century was released oh, in theaters. You know, that's eligible <laughs> because it came out in theaters before it was on TV. Yeah. That's right. So Buck Rogers in the 25th Century would be uh, right. Captain uh, William Buck but Rogers. But it will not be on Frozen by <laughs> cosmic forces beyond imagination. <laughs> beyond. Like, <laughs> 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 Written by Kip Lennon. 
the the the, the lyrics for uh, that that oh, yes. wonderful song. By the way, kids out there listening in podcast land, if you have not seen the pilot or the theatrical cut of Buck Rogers in the 25th century, you need to watch it for this reason and yeah. this reason alone, the main title <laughs> sequence, which I have no explanation for at all whatsoever. It is I do. What is it? Well, you know the thing was It's amazing. When they when they did the theatrical because Galactica they put in theaters after, you know, they had it shown on ABC. And basically, it's the same thing as the three-hour premiere with like a couple minor alterations. And it was so successful, they said, "Well, what if we premiere Battle of Buck Rogers in theaters before it's on TV? Because it came out in the fall, but they showed it in the summer. We'll make even more money." They didn't. But um, <laughs> the uh, the thing about the credit sequence at the time, the series was all going to be. If you remember that that tag, Buck Rogers. You have no identity in the 25th century. You could go anywhere, be anyone. You could be the ultimate secret agent because, you know, no one knows who you are, you know? So it's an homage to the James Bond. Because oh, yeah. that was the uh, concept? Concept. Wow. And so you have, like, all these women sitting on planets and nebulas, <laughs> you know, and Aaron Gray looking super sexy and luminous. Sexy. And uh, <laughs> it, it is the most... And that awful song, like, you, you know, you said, Far Beyond the Stars. So we screened that. I remember at oh, the Cinema that was Tech. Great. And that a lot was a of people night. had only seen it on TV, had no idea about this credit yeah. sequence. And it is insane. Yeah. It's so awesome. Awesome, not the word. No, no. It's oh, awesome. I, it's awesome. It it's is awesome. awesome. <laughs> it's so bad. It's on YouTube. You can look at it. And you, if you don't want to sit through the whole thing, go on YouTube. And it, you just put in uh, Buck Rogers' uh, uh, theatrical main title credit sequence. And it's it's glad. It's glad. It's awesome. We should put it on our Facebook. We'll put it on our Facebook page and our YouTube page uh, for 430 Movie. Damn so you right. can check it out because it's it's awesome. 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 So we have an abundance of riches. And well, I'm sure there's more. We mentioned Army of Darkness. Oh, my God. With the great yes. Bruce Campbell. Which, which is weird that I didn't think of that because I, I have every every edition of that film ever put out on any sort of medium <laughs> whatsoever, period. Because I love that movie like in irrational ways. Yeah. And, and I, I don't know why because uh, his name is Ash. Any other thoughts, Steve? Well, it's and Primer. Primer, yep. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, Edge of Tomorrow. Oh, yeah. okay. Right. 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 Groundhog Live Day, Die, the really... sci-fi version. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, source Code. Mm-hmm. Uh, Interstellar. Yeah. Oh, yeah. What about uh, Safety Not Guaranteed? I haven't seen that. I really oh, wanted good. to see that. You yeah. should see it. Yeah. It's good. Yeah. I like it. It's not good enough to warrant a Star Wars movie, but... Yeah. <laughs> well, you know what? Whatever, whatever happened there, it turned out great, so... Oh, no, not that one. No. No, I, I was thinking Colin's film. Thinking Rogue One is great. Yeah, we don't know episode nine, but uh, yeah. he's no longer on it, um, Trevor Bow. Because his safety was not guaranteed. Yeah. His safety <laughs> was not guaranteed by Kevin Kennedy. That's right. Um, Contract, not guaranteed. Anything else? No. That's, well, uh, and none of these things, me, by the way, were my out-of-the-box pick, but it, I'm not telling you what it was. It kind of comes down to <laughs> – I'll go back in time and find out. It came <laughs> back – it comes down to me to either The Terminator or Star Trek Four, And I know – no. No? No, no. I know you hate it. I hate Star Trek Four. I'm strong. Um, I've always hated Star Trek Four, and I always will. No, you know, the thing about Star Trek Four is it has such a great message, even though I don't Does love it? the movie. Yeah. What's the message? The message is, I love Italian, and so do you. <laughs> <laughs> the message is, we have another where you podcast about Star Trek, <laughs> and it's a great chance to slide it in there to cross-promote. So let's talk about it on that podcast and leave it off of this one, because I think we should go with it Terminator. Is it? Well, yeah, I, think I don't know. I still like Groundhog Day an awful lot. I do too. But, but Terminator is a time travel movie. It's all about the, the the paradoxes of time travel. It's about going back in time, changing the past that affects the future. It is that definitive template. And how many it, times has it been imitated? We could probably name fifty B science fiction movies throughout the next thirty years that ripped off Terminator. It, it had such an impact in the way that Back to the Future, there's probably no movie, sci-fi movie, that had more of an impact, you know, uh, than, than Terminator, other than Star Wars. Or Alien. Definitely oh. hugely, uh, uh, you know, uh, important film. But I think Groundhog Day has also been imitated uh, quite often, and that also deals with this time paradox of being stuck in this time loop and uh, mm-hmm. having to relive the same day over and over again and uh, what would you do with that ability and how it basically drives him insane and right. I but th- how long did they figure out that he was reliving that same day something like it was years and years yeah. but it doesn't have a great musical day. sting like dun 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 
you know? Look, I would not argue with Terminator. I love it. It's great. And I, I agree with everything you say. But I just want to make sure we give Groundhog Day. Groundhog time. Day does not have Arnold. I, but it has look, Bill Murray. I owe <laughs> the sort of rebirth of my career to the Terminator. So um, you should recuse yourself. <laughs> Shit, good point. No, Why um, start now? But no, I mean, look, I just I, I say that, that just as I like I I love the Terminator on such a a deep deep level. I don't even know where to begin to describing like how much I love that movie and how much I thought about it. Um, do and you, I do you have the novelization, by the way. I don't. Do you realize that sells for like hundreds of dollars? Does the it? paperback, oh, no, no, of Terminator, the first Terminator. Really? William Wisher, I believe, wrote the novelization. Oh By the way, I had the pleasure of meeting him. He is the nicest man. Ah. Totally that. Um, I met him at Jim Cameron's 33rd birthday party. Jesus. Oh, well, you, you got to actually be. <laughs> yeah, that beats me. That beats me like an old rug. Yeah. Um, I, I, okay, I was going to say. I was going to be all partisan about Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. Um, dun, I, dun, dun, dun. But I feel the winds of the war. future war yeah. moving towards the Terminator. And as much as I love Groundhog Day, it's another one of those movies that I think um, kind of can slot into some different things and maybe deserves more than sort of the Friday argument. Um, I, so if I have to... Patton. Gladiator. Uh, We're going back in time to a previous episode. The Terminator. All right. I vote for the Terminator. I vote for the Terminator. Sure. I'll go along with that. Friday. Okay, so Monday. Back to the future. Tuesday. The time machine. Wednesday. Time after time. Thursday, it's midnight in Paris. And Friday, it's do-do-do-do-do. The Terminator. I think if it went do-do-do-do-do, it would be a lot less threatening. Right. But do 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 or, or, or <laughs> just just listen to our new podcast. Do 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 do. He can't be bargained with. He can't be reasoned with. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It doesn't feel pity or remorse of fear. And it absolutely. Will Arnold, how do you stuff. feel about this? I love the t- the choice for Friday, and uh, I, hopefully it'll give me some more money. <laughs> <laughs> well, on behalf of Arnold, Darren, Steve, myself, we're so glad you joined Ashley. us for Time Travel Week. <laughs> he just I'm not thanking time. you at all I'm not glad you Ironically, joined us Ironically we're out of time He's disappeared We're out of time But we will be back next Friday Hopefully With an all new episode Of the 4-3 movie Wherever you listen to podcasts Meanwhile we hope you'll check out Our sister shows Inglorious Trexperts The ultimate Star Trek podcast With Darren Doctorman and myself Disco Nights A celebration of Star Trek Discovery Featuring host Chase Masterson And guests Meanwhile if you want to check out Previous episodes of the 4-3 movie Or purchase some of our Great Go Back in Time uh, or, or some of our great 430 Movie logo wear, you can go to 430movie.com or suggest future theme weeks. Tell us how we screwed up this week at Twitter or 430 movie po- at 430moviepodcast.com or on Facebook at 430 Movie. And if you're feeling really generous, please go to Apple Podcasts and rate us five stars. It really makes a difference because it helps call attention to our podcast so new fans can discover it. Uh, you know, if they see uh, that has been ranked five stars, they say, hey, I want to check this out. If it's been, you know, three stars, they think, oh, my God, it's Star Trek Four. Um, finally, um, a very special thanks to Bill Ritter and uh, producer Natalie Mascali, everyone here at uh, Electric Studios for making the show possible. Big shout out to Dean. Until next week, on behalf of all of us here on the Fourth Day Movie, thanks for joining us. And Eyewitness News starts now. Happy New Year. This episode brought to you by Chome, Combite Honate Ober Advancer Mercantiles. The spice must flow.